John Giles, wide receiver out of West Florida. RC already threw up the full scouting report on ffmetrics.com, so you can check it out. RC, why are you excited about Giles? Just for some background, and he this is a D2 uh, wide receiver prospect. West Florida is a D2 school. Uh, I scout about, I see about 200 wide receivers prospects per season i i see their data and some level of tape almost like american idol i give just about any wide receiver declared for the draft a shot where i'll look at their tape i look at their data and if the data is telling me there might be something there like the pro day data or their output performance um, statistically whatever it is that rings us up to take a look I'll take a look and if it's a lower scored player I'm not going to give them much time they better get my attention quick Um, but Giles came up uh, scored really well in our um, scouting models just the on paper metrics so then I when that happens I'm excited to turn on the tape I never know what I'm going to see especially when it's a D2 guy but I had seen a series I'd been working on a lot of D2 and FCS players and just couldn't find that there usually there's one guy that just stands out every scouting season. And this year there really hasn't been one for me uh, really until Giles. So I had done several during the day. Giles, I didn't know who he was, popped on the tape after I saw good numbers and then that got my attention. And I'm not... I'm looking to um, dismiss, I'm looking to rule out the, these prospects. Like, I want them, they need to impress me to make me dig further. And Giles was one of the first ones down deep where I was like, who is this guy? This tape is exciting. So I would say, after we're done talking about him, if you've watched this video all the way through, you really need to go watch his scouting tape, and he's put out some pro scouting tape, five minutes long, a highlight reel for the NFL. I think his management team has put it out, so he's got a couple things out there. Uh, but when you watch it, like the first five or six plays, I'm like, the first play is just looks amazing. I didn't know if it was a great camera shot or what, but it was like it looked like he jumped. Looked like Michael Jordan taken off on the free throw line to catch pass. I was like, whoa, who is this? Then the next couple plays was just him dominating, which is what you want to see of a D2 guy. But this started with the numbers, the pre numbers looked good. Then I flipped on the tape and I was like, wow. He he first reminded me of Tyrell Williams, which can be a bit of a a ghost from the past of a D2 player that kind of came out of nowhere that we scouted and said was one of the 10 best wide receivers in his draft class when he wasn't even hardly on a list anywhere nationally. Uh, He didn't get drafted. He got signed by the undrafted free agent by the Chargers. And then long story short, he was so good in the preseason, they ended up keeping him on the roster. He He played his rookie season. Uh, if I remember correctly, he played his rookie season, but then he broke out, I think, in year two or year three, and he started to become maybe their best weapon. I think Keenan Allen was hurt like when he was always hurt. Tyra Williams came in and and was a was a sensation for a short period of time, kind of out of nowhere. So Giles reminded me of that at first, but Giles had a bit of a different styled game. I would say that that John Giles reminds me of my scouting of Javon Baker, which is a very competent, uh, physically tough, good contested catch. Um, just kind of a, a presence of a receiver, but John Javon Baker to me has some limitations where I wouldn't say he's a future superstar, but what I saw in John Giles to me was a better version potentially of Javon Baker. It's hard to say that when you're watching him against D2 uh, uh, defensive backs, but from all, I mean, I'm looking at 200 guys. I'm, I'm, and I've done that for 15 years now. So 
I've got a catalog in my head of when somebody, when I see something different, whether it's at the D2 level or an international player or in the Canadian Football League or wherever it is, uh, I usually know it when I see it. So that was, I'm kind of basing it on on my numbers, but also on the tape with Giles. And I think there's a, there's a little bit of Des Bryant um, that in Giles, just that that physical presence that has the athleticism to get open but if you got him covered he's gonna he can go over the top of you make catches um i think there's something here i'm not saying this is the next locked in hall of fame nfl player superstar i'm just from my scouting there's a lot of smoke here and i think there's a fire when i started to dig into it more so RC, first off, when you said Tyrell Williams, that kind of hit home because if you're a longtime FFM, FF Metrics subscriber, that is a name that should ring a bell and definitely got me through some times through uh, in my uh, fantasy football leagues. But let's stick to Giles. He's not a small guy, 6'3", 205 pounds. He looks like he can play that big wide receiver role, right? Here's the thing. You've probably seen them, and when we're doing uh, these short-form video scouting, I try to ask Andrew not to dig too deep, but he's going to get familiar with the player. He's going to go out and look at some of the basics, and and which I that's what I want because I want him to be able to either ask questions or have reactions to new information that he's hearing um, on the video interview but he's you see 63 200 63 205 he his pro day he was nearly 63 um but 219 pounds so oh, he's he, big so he's 219 and 17 reps on the bench which is good for that size not great not bad is good uh four five seven uh four five four forty time let me it's so not, if I don't not, get the, it right. not the fastest if he's in the four or five for the receivers, but the Seattle, do you think like his on field? I mean, sometimes it's not indicative if he has well, for like his, the yeah, yeah, for his size, four, five, seven for his style. It's good. Okay. One, five, seven, 10 yard. It's good. It's not great. It's not, he's not a blazer, uh, but he's not slow either. And on field, it looks different. There was there's some on his highlight reel that you can see on YouTube. There's some moments where he's making catches and pu- just pulling away, like changing directions and just pulling away from guys who look like they have the angle. That's another thing that caught me watching his tape is he had some dominant moments on tape, which is what you want to see of somebody you're interested in for the NFL. You want them to just look like they're toying with the opposition at the D2 level. So he's so he's bigger than most places have him listed. Um, so I don't know if he bulked up uh, for the pro day, but if he, if he bulked up to 219 and ran a 457, if he wanted to play at 210, you know, maybe he gets down to a, a 45. But I think him being a muscular, uh, bigger receiver works for him. But the background story is crazy. Um, so that's what I want to add in to kind of wrap up his story. Because when I first came across this and I looked at the tape, I'm like, why why aren't more people talking about this guy? Like, I didn't even know this guy existed until a couple weeks ago. Where is everybody on this? And then my my brain, my scouting brain immediately switches to there's going to be a story. There's going to be an arrest there's going to be something in here that makes me just drop the case um, because this guy's never going to make it. That's that has to be the reason why he's a D two. So, really, kind of a bizarre background, and see what lands in this. See if this makes you feel better or just neutral on why Giles is was stuck as D two. So, his background is. In high school, he was a top safety in North Carolina. First team, all-state safety. He was 
bound to be a defensive player. Uh, he has a brother who played for UNC. I think that was a cornerback. Uh, another brother that I don't forget what position he plays, but I think he's like FCS or D2. So all his brothers are played college football. He comes along and he gets recruited to Marshall to be a safety. He played some receiver and running back in high school, but he was primarily a safety. He can't get into Marshall because of his academics. So when I saw that, I immediately was like, well, I see where this is going. This We got a knucklehead on our hands. But spoiler alert, we don't. I don't think we do. Um, so he doesn't go to Marshall. He has to go to junior college to start his career, to get his grades, to get credits and all that, to be able to um, go back and try to get to D1. So he goes to JUCO, plays two years, does really well, but he tra- he transitions, he becomes a wide receiver when he goes to JUCO. He ditches safety, he's now a wide receiver. So he's learning how to play wide receiver, but it's at the JUCO ranks. So he's just, his natural ability, he's going to be better than than everybody else. And he was, so much so that he was a top, once he finished his two years, he was a top recruit. He was getting offers from Houston and Memphis and Liberty. He was at that level of transfer. Uh, But when he looked to make that move, there was a credits issue with his junior college, and it wasn't going to transfer over, wasn't going to let him get accepted into these schools academically. So when I saw that, I'm like, oh, Lord, this this guy has, has to be a knucklehead. So he finishes his two years JUCO. He can't take any of the D1 offers he's getting. The CFL reaches out to him. I think the British Columbia Lions offered him a contract to come play in the CFL after two years of JUCO. So this guy is is definitely not nothing. Um, Some people have noticed him. I think he might have gone to play in the CFL, but then COVID hit. It was 2020. So that ended all of that. So looking for a place to play in college or maybe go to the CFL in 2021, the head coach of Virginia Union uh, knew about him. I think the uh, coach's son played with him at junior college. So they're like, you mean we can get this guy that the CFL was interested in, that D1 programs were interested in? We could get him at that D2 Virginia Union? you got to be kidding me. But – because of his credits issue, he couldn't go D1, is is the way I'm seeing the story uh, reported. And so he goes, commits to Virginia Union, but he takes the year off, 2021, to get his grades in line. He's like, it looks like, from, from what I've researched, he was going to try to get his grades in line and trying to get his... And he admitted... Uh, that he screwed that he was a screw off in high school and didn't take his grade serious and it obviously was coming back to bite him, but he was trying to rectify it. Um, so he transferred to Virginia Union, but didn't play. Took a year off to try to get his academics going. I'll take I'll take them at their word for that that it was that or you know and not that he was ineligible and had no other choice. It seemed like he was making a choice to take a year off to get his academic career right so then the next season he does he's good to go plays for virginia union has a really nice season i don't know if teams were after him still or d1s were after him still or not i know there seem still seem to be some credit issues with getting um enough to get to a major college so he winds up at west florida which is another d2 program and in 2023, so which is going to be his obviously his last year of college play, it's there where he has the full, his best year of his career. He scores half of his team's touchdowns, 16 touchdown catches, catches half the their scores. He's up for the Harlan Hill Award, which is the, the Heisman D2. Um, he just has a great season. He's a, he's a great presence in the league, and everybody knows it. He's so good that 
or he's good enough, which, however you want to say it, to, he gets invited to the postseason college gridiron showcase for D2 players, uh, the all-star game, which would be a natural for him to be invited to. He did so well in season. So um, he goes, he has a really nice week there, so much so that the Hula Bowl, which is a step up, which has D1 players, and the, the Hula Bowl's a watered-down um, senior bowl uh, for the guys that didn't get invited to the senior bowl they're going to the east west shrine or they're going to the hula bowl the hula bowl had an opening and there was word was going around about his college gridiron showcase all-star week prior and they invited him out to the hoop so he raced out so he was a, he got the good play at the hula bowl and got more attention there um, i watched a little it's it's hard to for receivers to get any type of targets worth a darn in an all-star game. So, but he got to play in the hula bowl and I, I know he at least had one catch and he was open several times for touchdowns, but the quarter, the lines breaking down, the quarterbacks can't see anything. Um, it's usually low scoring. So it's not, he didn't have any MVP performance, but I don't know that anybody did uh, at the hula bowl with the quarterbacks there. So, but he got more buzz from being at the the Hula uh, Bowl All Star Game. So he's catching attention. Some website or ranking service listed him as the fourth best um, small school, fourth best fourth best D two and or FCS prospect, maybe or maybe it was just D two. So he's getting some attention. Some rating services don't even list him as a prospect that exists. But there are some others that are kind of on to him from his hula bowl work and gridiron showcase before that, that where he's getting on the, he's getting into the top 100 receivers. He's getting into the top 75 receivers on some site. So I think he deserves a higher ranking from, from a talent perspective with obviously more research needs to go on his background for teams to get vested. But I think it's possible he might get a seventh round draft pick out of this out of nowhere with this crazy background. He for sure will be a high priority uh, undrafted free agent. And then he'll, then it's up to the football gods from there. But um, I'm, it was a weird, interesting backstory, but really what started it all was our numbers rang up well, our base numbers rang up well after his pro day and his output. But then when I watched the tape, I was like, there's something different here about this prospect over all the other lower level off the grid wide receiver prospects. So that's where we come to this John Giles video and my scouting report will be is out on fantasyfootballmetrics.com. And you can read it in full and see what our computer comps are for his style of play. I mentioned Javon Baker, Des Bryant, and Tyrell Williams. But our computer models had some different names that I thought were interesting that they saw as physical and output-wise comps. RC, one more question before we hop off. I was going to ask you whether you thought this kid had a chance of being drafted. Sounds like you think if he does, it will be somewhere in the seventh round. But... If I'm, if we're doing dynasty rookie drafts, right? Is this guy in consideration at all to be drafted, or do you have to see him in the preseason before making that determination? I mean, I want to see him in the preseason. That this is going to be a long haul, whether he's a seventh rounder or whether he's an undrafted free agent. That's a big hurdle to get over. It's especially in a draft where there's so much wide, receiver yeah, talent. Wide receiver yeah. talent is insane. The not only is the is are the the top names really the top names, and it's deep. The amount of of um, top guy names, guys who's graded out great for us. Usually, there's only a handful of them. Now there's like a baker's dozen of guys that you could legitimately see being Pro Bowlers and All Star type of players. But I've never seen so much talent. At the bottom, when I'm looking through the the D2 guys and the FCS guys and the mid-majors now, I'm seeing some... I mean, it's almost like every other guy 
that I look at that goes to, you know, places like Indiana State and Incarnate Word and Yale and, you know, West Florida and the international program, I'm like, I can't believe how talented these guys are. Um, it's Why do you just... think that is, RC? Do you think people are just like saying, I'm going to play offense because that's what the league's getting geared towards? So it's just the offense is just attracting all these athletes? And I personally think because of football's popularity, there's so many athletes that probably would have focused on basketball, but there's limited opportunities in basketball versus football in theory and football so popular and they it, when these great basketball athletes start playing football wide receivers a natural place for them to go to and use those basketball skills and then they're great at football and they have you know a lot of these wide receivers were great high school basketball players too but the more and more of them, they're going the football route, not the basketball route for the money, for the attention, for whatever. So I, I just think we've just got a surge of athletes. And, and you see it in the cornerback group. There's a lot of really good corners in this draft. So I think the basketball player talent that can't catch a football end up going on to defense. And now we got a lot of, you know, really nice natural athletes uh, in coverage. So, and I don't think the crazy thing is this draft is so deep. If we get another one like it next year and the year after, I don't know where all these guys are going to play. Every NFL team is going to have four all stars uh, wide receivers on, you know, on their roster. And that's one of the things that's going to hurt Giles from trying to make it in the um, league. Like Tyrell Williams, it was an easier path because there wasn't as many talented wide receivers like him. But Giles, man, he's got to make it through a jungle of talent from this draft, from the prior drafts. Um, he he's going to get his chance to show, but it's a it's a narrow window for these small school guys to jump through. So I wish him well. But to your question, is he is he dynasty draftable? I mean, at a certain point, but I got to see where he lands. And I certainly would love to see the, obviously I want to see him in the preseason, but he's, he's, uh, he's on my fifth round, sixth round flyer list in dynasty rookie drafts. That's helpful. And I guess we'll, for those, those of you that are draft mix like us, watch out for him in the seventh round. If you see his name called, you guys heard it here. So Hopefully he gets drafted in the seventh round. If not, we'll be we'll have eyes on him during the preseason and give you guys updates then. And if he does get drafted in the seventh round, it means that he got the full background check and everything was great and teams didn't want to wait to to miss out on him in a bidding war as a UDFA. So being a seventh round pick versus being allowed to go to UDFA, there's pros and cons to it for the player and for the teams. But if somebody actually makes him a pick in the seventh round, I'm going to be overjoyed. I'm still going to follow him and be excited for him as a UDFA, undrafted free agent. But if he gets drafted in the seventh round, it means somebody sees something that they're going to dive in on and they want to lock it up. They don't want to leave it to chance on phone calls afterwards. Yeah. Now, for those of you that thought you can tune out after the first, second, and third rounds, you have something to watch for on Saturday when they do rounds four through seven. So... Well, thank you all for listening, and if you want more details, check out RC site, ffmetrics.com.